the Education Alumni Affiliate Zoom. Uh, my name is Peter Goodman. I'm the president of the Education Alumni. Um, the Education Alumni has 3,000 members who are former teachers, mostly in New York City. Some are still, uh, 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 are still working, some are retired, some have gone on to doing a wide range of other things. Um, the purpose of the alumni is basically to support the college. And remember, the college is supported through public funds. It does not have billions of dollars as Harvard or Yale. And it struggles to get the state to, to provide dollars every year. So one of the advocacy groups supporting the college is the Alumni Association. And we try to use whatever influence we have um, to get funds to the state and to simply inform people how successful the college is. As you know, in a recent uh, study of the thousands of colleges in the nation, City College was on at the top of the list for what's called social mobility, which means they started college in poverty and 15 years later, we're in the middle class. So of all the colleges in the country, we're in the top 10 of, uh, in the social mobility index. So we're doing a wonderful job and we're providing the graduates who are gonna get wonderful jobs, pay taxes to fund our social security. So it's very important that the college succeed. You're supposed to laugh. Um, so let me introduce uh, Dean Lamboy, who's the Dean of the School of Education. We work closely with the School of Education. As I mentioned, um, I go to Albany every month when uh, before COVID and now uh, do it online, try to keep track of all the many things going on in education and keeping him in the loop and getting his point of view that I can tell the members of the Board of Regents on what those people on the front lines have, have to say. As I said, I'm a big believer in teacher voice, that those people who are most knowledgeable of the best information are those people in schools. Um, and, I, and of course, the last two years have been extremely difficult, but you people have done a wonderful job. Um, remember, the kids in the system have looked to you as the one stable thing in their lives. Um, so when we decided to do this, the, the person we first identified, unfortunately, became very ill on Monday and had to drop out. And we were ecstatic to get Dr. Corigliano, Cor excuse me, um, who actually is an expert in just what we're talking about. So I'd like to introduce him and ask him to take over the program at this point. Frank? Sure. Good afternoon. Thank you um, for that uh, introduction. And thanks, everyone, for taking the time out of your busy schedule. Um, I know even though it's, you know, hopping on a Zoom, there's a million things that are competing for our time on our dance cards. Um, so I really appreciate seeing everyone around the room. Um, I have a, a soft spot for um, anything CUNY related. Uh, my undergraduate degree is from Baruch. Uh, college, which is part of the CUNY system. Um, I very much um, identify, I, I, uh, I got a little warm uh, feeling in my heart when I heard that uh, City College was doing so well in terms of social mobility. Uh, I myself am uh, a first generation college student, so nobody in my family had ever gone to college. Um, and in fact, that you know, the goal, you know, kind of the high goal was to, to finish high school. Um, and, and try and make sure as many of those, uh, as many of us uh, would do that. Um, so, uh, so, so I really identify and, and um, respect the idea of social mobility and the role that City College and um, CUNY uh, plays in that in helping people move forward. Um, so with that, uh, um, I uh, also appreciate uh, being invited to participate in this. Uh, it sounds like we have a great group of speakers, uh, you know, who are out there in the field, uh, teaching and learning. And, uh, and I want to make sure there's lots of time for, uh, to hear them. Um, what I'll do is give a, a little overview of who I am, um, uh, kind of some of the roles that I've been playing over the past 
a couple of years and um, some of the things that I've noticed. Um, so with that, uh, my name is uh, Dr. Frank Corigliano. I'm a clinical psychologist. I, uh, I'll share my screen here, which just has a couple of slides, which, which may be interesting. Are, are those seen okay? Excellent. I see heads nodding. Thank you. Um, so about two years ago, I started working uh, in schools. Uh, so right before the pandemic, uh, I've specialized in telepsychology. So doing um, psychological services through video uh, for the past nine or so years, ever since I got my PhD. It was something that I was very interested in. Initially working under the uh, under the supervision and, and care and guidance of Dr. Phyllis Harrison Ross, uh, who was a bicultural woman. Uh, she was a uh, child uh, psychiatrist, a pediatrician, and she has been doing tele had been doing telepsychiatry for decades. She also served as the co-commissioner on the Commission of Corrections, which oversees all the jails and lockups in New York State. So she understood how video could be used to connect people from resources and family and mental health services. So part of my postdoc, I started working in Rikers Island, uh, developing and rolling out a program called Supportive Te Televisiting Services, which connected children and teenagers with their incarcerated parent through telepresence. All the jails and lockups have video uh, connections there. They use them for psychiatry and lawyer visits. So we were able to gain access to those and, and provide family televisits through those units. So we expanded that throughout the Rikers Island system, some of the state facilities, and then eventually we connected with the New York Public Library, the Brooklyn Public Library, and the Queens Public Library to do library-based televisiting, which was also very exciting. So, one of the things I, I really enjoy doing is leveraging technology to address clinical and social issues. So how can I figure something out and, and share it with other people? So that brings me forward to right before the pandemic, just about two years ago, we launched school-based televisiting and school-based telemental health. So the idea was for the telemental health piece is that I would be beaming into schools uh, through video like this, and I would be working with the individual students uh, to do initial assessments and ongoing individual and family therapy, which uh, at the time was groundbreaking. <laughs> and, and people, you know, had their doubts and they weren't sure, but there was also a lot of excitement and support. Um, so, so they brought me in and we started doing these projects and it was literally right before the pandemic hit. So fortunately, because it was telemedicine, I was able to work closely with the, with the principal and the counselors and, and the students and very quickly switch to home-based telemental health during the pandemic. So what that allowed us to do is to continue to give support to students and families throughout the pandemic. Uh, I'm just going to um, close my share screen just because um, I'm not covering that content right now. And I think it'll clear up some space on your desktops. Um, so what we were able to do is uh, during the pandemic, beam into the homes and, and do uh, therapy with not only the students, that was our initial concern is can we connect to the students, but then also because at that time, a lot of people were home, including the family members, we were able to include the other family members. So we were able to work with the students in their home, uh, which allowed for unprecedented access not only to the students, but their entire life. I see heads nodding. Um, so this was a really special opportunity. Uh, we had, um, you know, mothers and fathers and um, often, you know, extended family members who were often caregivers. So we had aunts and uncles and uh, older siblings and younger siblings. 
Uh, we had everything, including the family pets running by during the sessions. Uh, it was a really, really cool opportunity that fortunately uh, is going to be one of the things from the pandemic that, that has shifted and is now the new normal. So now the idea of doing teletherapy and supporting students at home is, is hopefully part of our DNA and is an ongoing option. So, so that's where we started. Uh, and that was in a uh, elementary school, uh, I'm sorry, a middle school. Uh, and then also uh, we expanded into two high schools. So one of the high schools was High School of World Cultures, which is primarily for new arrival students uh, who, who came to this country uh, through um, all kinds of different uh, reasons, for different reasons, and from different places. Uh, many Spanish-speaking places, a lot of Dominican Republic, a lot of Ecuador, Honduras, a lot of... Um, uh, people also from other places like Africa. So we had, you know, French speaking people. So it was a really nice opportunity to be able to support a range of students. Um, once we started working with the students, we realized that um, the, the teachers also needed uh, assistant or assistance and, and they wanted their own time. Right. So, <laughs> so teachers, what we realized is, you know, teachers were also going through the pandemic. Right. So teachers were uh, also trying to suddenly teach remotely and, and teach remotely from their home often and teach remotely from their home while their kids are there. And they're trying, I see heads nodding, lots of heads nodding. Yes. <laughs> uh, so, so, so the teachers were going through their own process and, and they really needed their own support and they needed a, a, a safe place where they could talk about what was going on for them and also where they could get some, some skills and some guidance around how to teach remotely, how to balance um, work and life. Um, how to acknowledge, that was a big piece. And, and a few kind of themes that I would put out there is one, just acknowledging what they were going through, what we were all going through, what we continue to go through. That's, that, that's crucial. Just saying this happened, right? This continues to happen. Uh, this is happening. This will continue to happen. Um, is a really important thing. Just, just naming that, stating that, and then we can build out from there. Okay, what does that mean? Like, what happened? What is happening? What might happen? Um, and, and giving some context for all that. So that's a, kind of one of my first uh, things I want to underscore, um, which also goes into, I read some of the, the comments that the teachers submitted that we'll hear from. So that's one of the themes that came out of that is acknowledging what happened. Um, and then the second piece is processing what happened. How do we kind of deal with what happened? And some of that is by sharing our stories, right? Putting pen to paper and kind of expressing it and organizing it and sharing it and getting feedback and having ourselves say things out loud. Uh, a lot of the events that happened were traumatic. Uh, we had the schools I'm in are in uh, District 12, which is the Bronx. Uh, so I was in uh, middle schools, high schools, and elementary schools uh, during the entire pandemic uh, in the Bronx. Um, and a lot of these students were going through very, very difficult experiences. Hold on just a second. Okay. <laughs> Principal Rodriguez uh, came in. Um, so, so just kind of like, how do we process this stuff? How do we acknowledge this? Stuff? And I'll point to a few references about that as well. Um, another piece is accepting. Once we've kind of identified something happens, we start processing it, is how do we come to terms with it? How do we move away from just denying it or just being angry about it when we look at stages of grief, right? We're all going through this grief process. And how do we get to a point where we accept what happens and then we can start talking about resilience? So that's another main theme that's, that's really important is how do we build resilience in our students? So that's 
one of it was really great. Principal Rodriguez kind of <laughs> popped in. Uh, so these schools are bringing me in as a clinical psychologist to work with their teachers, work with their students. I'm doing push-ins uh, where you push into the class, uh, where I'm, I'm doing um, interventions for the entire class. Most of them are, I'm on the smart screen, so I'm doing it through video. And I, so last semester I worked with the entire eighth grade. I saw the, every single eighth grade class once a week uh, for like three months um, and, and just kind of walking them through what is mental health, what is a psychologist, who wants to become a psychologist, <laughs> who wants to go to, you know, City University. Um, so just kind of really working with them um, because these principals and administrators uh, have prioritized mental health. What we know is that we just got a new round of testing. A lot of the students are testing at two to three years behind what they would expect. Um, so they get that, we understand that, that's out there. The other piece that's really important is to get out there that social emotional learning, mental health is also lagging behind. Um, and so when we have students who are in the eighth grade, but their maturity in some areas is more like a sixth grade. So once we started, again, acknowledging that and accepting that, then, then it just gives us a different perspective, right? And we understand it's gonna take a few years to kind of work this out. And it's gonna take um, doing things differently. It's gonna take extra supports. It's gonna take naming it, processing it, and building resilience uh, in order to help our students uh, catch up. Um, and also our teacher, what we also realized is that teachers, often teachers are new teachers, right? They have been teaching, you know, less than three years right? The past two years has been a global pandemic. You as teachers or student teachers um, have not had the typical teaching experience, right? Through no fault of your own, we always say, um, this has not been typical. And so also some of your development has been different. And so what we're seeing is some of the teachers who are doing remote teaching, they did not have maybe the typical mentorship on how to build those classroom management skills in, in a on-site classroom and settle, suddenly they're I thrown. Yeah, I did too. Okay, uh, so we're just muting that person. Uh, uh, so what we're also realizing is that teachers have been, you know, teaching in the wild, they call it. And, and so really giving the teachers the support that they need and also just naming it, like you haven't had the typical experience, your skills are gonna be different. Uh, and so, and, 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 and that's okay, right? Um, so that really helps them kind of breathe, um, just like with the students, with the teachers, also with the counselors and the principals. So I'm working directly with the principals, all the assistant principals, all the counselors, um, because the counselors need counseling. <laughs> You know, and so really just giving everyone their time and I'm able to kind of navigate and leverage all these relationships and kind of be the fabric that weaves in between them um, and just kind of spreading these messages of, of, you know, kind of I learned something from this group and share it with this group. Uh, it's been a really great um, opportunity and um, I'm just amazed at how creative and smart the teachers are and the counselors and the students and the families. And um, there's a lot of strength um, and a lot of great things that are coming. We talk about post-traumatic growth um, and shifts uh, for the first time in ever. Uh, the, the students in District 12, almost all of them, not all of them, we can talk about that, but almost all of them had internet in their home and had a computer or a laptop or a tablet, which they never had before. So a lot of our students are much more technologically savvy than two years ago. And so we're able to leverage those things and, and those are really great um, growth experiences. They're also better at using that technology to uh, support and develop their networks, uh, whether it's their friendship networks or their family networks um, or their learning opportunities. Um, so those are some other things is another core message is look at all sides of things and really highlight uh, the positive things that have come out of it while also acknowledging the trauma, because there has been 
you know, systemic generational trauma existing long before in a lot of our communities, long before COVID happened. So then COVID happened and um, it just exacerbated everything. So really acknowledging those pieces too. Um, I'm going to very quickly um, just show a few slides and I'll make them available afterwards if that's okay, um, because there are some, some nice resources. I like books. Um, so just when talking about students um, is, you know, talk simply, talk at the student's age or stage, um, talk when the student feels safe and comfortable. So if you're bringing up COVID and bringing up trauma, make sure they're in a place where they feel safe and comfortable. Watch the student's reaction when you're talking. And if the student looks uh, confused or upset, kind of slow things down. You know, it's okay to, to take your time. Um, uh, I love books. This is my book slide. Um, there's some really great books on recognizing student challenges due to COVID-19. Um, again, just uh, to highlight the COVID-related learning and social and emotional um, skills, uh, that there might be gaps or there might be differences in how these students are, are presenting um, as opposed to other students. Uh, also looking at communities of color, which I work uh, a lot with, is many of those uh, already had pre-existing stressors. They were made worse, including feelings of isolation and being disconnected from their communities due to language and cultural barriers, right? A lot of people were left isolated and in a panic. Um, and uh, so just acknowledging that. Um, some of these are younger books, but there's also older book equivalents, but I, I just wanted to show you some things. Um, Big Bird uh, does great work with resilience. <laughs> um, and these are fun things. Even if you're working with older students, it's fun to show these because often they have younger siblings and they can share them with their young, younger siblings. Um, a few of the um, pro tips that I picked up along the way is encouraging uh, teachers and families and students to really stay informed, show empathy, sticking to routine and structure. Um, you know, there's separate workshops I do on like, you know, how the COVID-19 became the COVID-25, became the COVID-30 in terms of weight. Um, and, and there's a lot of issues around that. I see a lot of smiles around the room. Um, so the idea of uh, retaking back structure and routine, or many of the students who are showing up in our classes today, they didn't have routine or structure uh, for the past two years in typical ways. Uh, we had the COVID drift, which means that, and, and this is also with people who work from home, they were getting up later and later and staying later and later. So now they're in school and they have these old routines that haven't been updated. Um, uh, practicing mindfulness, staying connected. Uh, something for really important I work with teachers on is teaching and using coping skills ourselves. So, so being able to find things that we think are really great and integrate them into our classroom. Um, so how do we do mindfulness? How do we do breathing? How do we do um, uh, building a routine? Things like that. Here's some really great books just to show you examples. A lot of people didn't know um, that there's really amazing resources and materials out there. Specifically, the one in the middle, My History of the COVID Pandemic, it's a journal for kids. So that's part of that processing, like who were your heroes during the pandemic? Um, and then also, how were you a hero? So really being mindful to uh, build the resilience and ask questions relating to, you know, who were you a hero to? Like, how did you, like, oh, I wore my mask or, oh, I looked after my grandmother or, oh, I taught my family how to do FaceTime so they could, you know, stay connected. So really being mindful and intentionally building narratives that are not only um, victimizing, uh, but also empowering um, because people were amazing. Um, and, and so acknowledging that. Uh, different stories of 13 kids from 11 countries sharing their life and thoughts about COVID, um, uh, calming kids' anxiety, uh, parenting in a pandemic, a COVID back to school guide, uh, managing your school. So this is like parents and teachers. COVID and kids, uh, Dr. Fauci, a boy from Brooklyn who became <laughs> America's doctor, uh, which is uh, with a very flattering uh, sketch of him. <laughs> Um, uh, Eleanor the Elephant goes back to school healthy. Why did the world stop? So there's a lot of really wonderful resources. Again, with Sesame Street, heroes wear masks. Even grouches wear masks. We do a lot of work around 
uh, mask adherence and, and stuff like that. Uh, don't let your dragon spread germs, which is great. I see a lot of smiles around the room. Um, and then also like how to, how to work with, there's tons of workbooks and resources out there to, to integrate social emotional learning into a class on a daily basis. Um, and that's really where a lot of the change happens. Um, so here's a few more. Um, so with that, um, I really wanna give lots of time to uh, the teachers who are sharing their stories, but I just wanted to give a little overview of what I'm seeing uh, in different classes across uh, the age and grade and, and stage and, and across um, all the players, right? So the students, the teachers, the principals, the guidance counselors, the assistance principals, and the families. Uh, so with that, I will uh, be quiet and I will pass the mic. Okay. Thank you. Tanjane, um, uh, Tanjane uh, uh, you are a teacher and a parent. How did COVID impact you as a, as a teacher, a parent, and how did it impact the kids in your class? Um, that's a great question. <laughs> so um, as I was listening to your presentation, I was nodding a lot because a lot of the memories came back. Um, I resonated with when first, when we went remote on March, 2020, all of a sudden, um, I'm a single parent and my son is in fourth grade now. When COVID happened, he was in second grade. Um, as you were sharing, um, we weren't ready for remote instruction at all, not as a parent, not as a teacher. Um, I teach the entire ninth grade at, a, um, at the Global Learning Collaborative High School. Uh, we weren't ready at all. So it was really, really traumatic um, having to figure out what to do. I also had my family, my sisters were here for, um, for spring break, some kind of break. They stayed over with me during a break and they all got stuck when we went remote. So I had to share a very tiny apartment with two, two of my sisters who were back from medical school, actually one from dental school, one from medical school. So we we're all remote in a one bedroom apartment. Um, it was really, really um, difficult to figure out how to teach remotely um, and how to also help my son with his second grade curriculum. I think that was the most challenging for me to do both at the same time, to show up for my students and for my son and for my family. Uh, my parents um, live next door, not so far away, um, that they are next apartment. And both of them are very um, high immunocompromised. Um, so I had to also make sure that no one goes near my parents uh, without like, at all. So we had to make sure we don't visit them and their grandchildren, my son and my sister, my other sister live next door too. And they have little, she has two um, little children who didn't understand why they can go see their grandparents. Um, all of those things were very difficult to manage and kind of figure out at the very earliest stages. Uh, thanks. Uh, Brenda, as, as a as a person training to be a teacher, and all of a sudden COVID hitting, um, how, did it, how did it impact you uh, personally? And how did it uh, impact your training to become a teacher? Well, um, when the pandemic hit, I was in my junior year at CCNY. And I hit a point where I was not ready for remote at all. Like I, I didn't even know about Zoom. So, it got to a point where I was very unmotivated in my classes. A lot of my family members got sick. I also had to share a family who came from Mexico, got stuck here for a year and a half. So I had 10 people in my house. I had to be on Zoom. My sister's in high school. I had to help her on Zoom. My mom is taking English courses at Lehman. I had to show her Zoom. I became like the IT person for my family. I, I It hit a point where I even started seeing my own um, college professors who were middle school teachers te tell us about their struggles and how they felt so much pressure to the point where I started thinking how long, if the pandemic lasts this long, do I really want to be in that position? Can I handle that position? I lost my motivation It and I lost my, I, I feel like all my courses were te taught me how to be so positive, how to help students, how to show all these risks and everything just seemed crashing down. Like I felt like everything I learned, I had to restart. 
And right now, being in the fourth grade class, um, I'm in the ICT classroom, and I get to see the impact that these kids really did have. They are very behind, and they're very unmotivated. They lost the structure. The last time they were in school was second grade. And now they're in fourth grade. They have no idea about the importance of state exams, or I have some students even ask me why school is important. Like, why can't we go back to our computer screen? I handed a permission slip the other day in class and I had a student ask me, can't this just be a Google form? And I never in my life would I think a nine-year-old would tell me, why can't you just put it on like on the computer? So it's, it's definitely a new situation. I've got my motivation back now because I feel like more than anything, I want these students to be on the level where they're supposed to be, be on, understand why school is important, feel motivated. A lot of them, they can do the work. They just, they don't know the importance anymore. They lost the structure, they lost the value. They didn't get the attention or all the resources that they needed. There was, and it wasn't the teacher's fault or the system, or it's just that the pandemic was, was very bad on some. I am, my school is in the Bronx. A lot of these kids still have family members who are currently sick. so. They, they'll come to school Monday and they won't come back until two weeks. And it'll be like, oh, my mommy was sick, right? We can't, we can't blame them. We have to catch them up. We have to find a way to make up for those two weeks while still being there for them emotionally. So it, in a way, the pandemic both, it, I would say it almost killed my motivation, but going back into the school now and seeing the students and how much they, like this need for, for attention and this need, this lack of motivation pushed me to want to help them meet their needs. So it was, it was both for me. It was like a, I would say a bad thing, but a good thing now. Thank you very much. Mallory, you're both a parent, a teacher and a supervisor and teachers look up to you and, and ask you for guidance. How did the pandemic affect your role as an assistant principal? Well, um, I actually, <laughs> I had my second child in um, March of 20, uh, in February of 2020, right before the pandemic hit. I'm sorry if you hear a little bit of noise, my kids just got home. <laughs> um, but it, it kind of threw everything out of whack. I, I was home with my husband and we had both of our kids with us. Um, and then um, it, the last year in March, I became an assistant principal, and it was it was a challenge to go back to schools and um, meet the needs of all of the students where they were. Um, a lot of our kids, as you know, um, Dr. Frank Corigliano mentioned, um, they were socially and emotionally, they were definitely grades below, right? So we, right now we have three grades of seventh graders basically in high school. <laughs> and, um, and that brings a lot of challenges as well because we, we, we know that some of the behaviors that we're seeing were, are because they did not have the time to really learn how to be social um, in, in a school setting for a while, you know? And um, so then there's that end. And then we have the end of, of um, the teachers also suffering through a lot of trauma and, and trying to come back and do a good job, but it's, there's a challenge there too, right? Because um, they're, they're not fully, um, not that they're not invested, but they can't be fully focused on, on the work of supporting their students when they're also struggling with all of these other things, including childcare and so on. I mean, if we just start talking about attendance rates, this past few um, months um, <laughs> of the school year, I mean, attendance has been all over the place and it's difficult to fault people when, when their kids' schools close and, and when they have people that become ill, when they are concerned that they might be ill and, um, I also handle a lot of the COVID testing in school, and that I mean that's a whole other level of um, of stress. So we've we've been we've been doing our best. We've definitely been learning a lot. We've tried to be as empathetic as possible, um, and that's also very challenging when you also want to have a certain level of of rigor and and you want teachers to to look at data and do all these other things that we were doing prior to the pandemic. It's kind of like we have to recoach everyone on how to you know how to just do the basics um and and it's true some of our teachers one of our teachers um was a brand new math teacher right before the pandemic hit and then we went off um uh you know and we were all remote and he did very well and then we came back and and he um he struggled again with classroom management because he didn't have the opportunities to really um you know do that 
in, in a classroom setting for, for the year. So even though he's a third year teacher, um, he's still struggling in, in that aspect. So um, it's, been, it's been a journey. <laughs> Thank you. Elvis, uh, you're working with a lot of children um, where English is not their first language. And I guess a lot of them look up to you as sort of a father figure. Uh, what's your role been in your school as, a, as both a, a teacher and a role model for your kids? Thank you, Peter, for that question. Um, that's a good question. When they actually come with that, many of them, I, you know, it just brought a lot of memories. Um, when the pandemic hit, I just want to say a little something. Um, I was also uh, the baseball coach at health professor in high school. So I had a very strong connection with uh, more personal collect connection with the students due to my coaching role and also my, my teaching role. Um, these students are hurting. Our students in, in, in New York City and in the world are hurting due to this pandemic. It, it's been something very traumatizing to them. And when they come to me, um, to show me the, how they are hurting and express to me the frustration of, of living in shelters uh, because parents lost their job and lost their apartment, um, not having probably food at home to, to, to eat and asking me sometimes, mister, can you buy me a sandwich? Uh, I haven't eaten breakfast. Uh, and, and me, like in between classes, rushing out to the deli and trying to get something to these kids, even though we have lunch in school. Uh, but sometimes they don't like school food, and uh, you know, unfortunately, it is it is a reality. Um, but regardless of the pain that we see them um, and uh, and the struggle, not only uh, the social emotional, but personally and at home. Um, we just need to be positive with them, you know, show them positivity, show them that it can be done, show them that we're going to get through this, that it's, 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 a, it's work in progress and that we need to work hard and that we cannot give up. Um, especially we have kids in, in my school, um, Gregorio Luperon, that don't know the system because they've basically been here for a couple of months in, in, in the United States. They don't know what counseling is. Um, they don't know what, who the guidance counselor is or what are the responsibilities of guidance counselors. They, they are very, very new to the system and they look up to us to, for, for that path, that light to try to understand not only the system, but what's going on. Like when, um, when Omicron hit a couple of, you know, a month ago, um, our school was hit really hard. Um, Gregorio Luperon, uh, teachers and, 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 and students. And I saw that in, in, the, in their faces, I saw that sense of loss, uh, like what's gonna happen next. And uh, the only thing that we can do is, is be there for them. Sometimes they just need somebody that can listen to them. Sometimes they just want to talk, talk about their frustration, about their anger, about how they wanna be in school and unfortunately they're forced to quarantine. And, uh, and they want to be in school because in school they can somehow express themselves and get support that maybe they are not getting at home. So this is some of the things that our, our kids are actually uh, going through. And, and that's, I think the best way we can serve as a role model is to show them that with hard work, with compassion, that things are going to get better. Um, that things are just going to get better and, we, and, we, and that we are there for them in any way or form that they need us. That's what we well, need to show our kids right now. Yeah. How do you deal with this personally for yourself? It's, it's, it's been challenging. Um, Marty and I, you know, we have talked in the past, uh, especially at the beginning of the pandemic. Uh, it's been challenging. Like I said, I have connection. I had a more connection with my, my student population because of my coaching role. Um, I get to know the parents a little bit more personally. And it wasn't easy. Look, when my phone rang after 9 p.m., I knew it was some bad news. Um, you know, I had many parents calling me. Um, my kids are intubated. And at the beginning of the pandemic, um, uh, I have students calling me. Uh, my grandmother died. 
uh, and it, it gets you. It, 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 it gets to you. And, you know, I used to talk to my wife about it. I said, like, my God, you know, it's getting to a point that it's becoming extremely overwhelming. It, it's becoming, um, you know, keeping me up at night, uh, up to a point. Um, and um, the, way, the way that for us, that, that the way that it worked for me is, is pressing yourself and having, having a support system, having someone in your family that can hear you, that can talk to you and give you some advice. Um, that's, that's how we dealt with it. Um, I, when, when the pandemic hit, I was working at health professions and I was blessed to have an amazing AP, um, Donna Lopecolo, that it doesn't matter the time that I grabbed my phone, she was always there to listen, not only to the good, but also to my frustration of, of what was going on and I think that that open line of communication helped a lot in, in me dealing with all the um, all the stuff that we were dealing with when at the beginning of the pandemic. Thank you, Dr. Frank. Uh, how again are, are respond to these comments? What advice do you have? Sure. Uh, so a, a lot of the, the themes are common themes, and, and I think we're hearing kind of the mix. Uh, one is, you know, again, just acknowledging that what we went through uh, over the past two years, what we're going through now, and what we're going to be going through over the next, you know, who knows how long, uh, has not been typical. And so what that does is, I, it was interesting, I was thinking, um, you know, as folks were talking is, okay, we've got the piece that the students are, um, you know, did not have the typical two-year experience. So if you're dealing with, um, you know, eighth graders, you know, they haven't been in class for, for two years, they've been learning at home. A, a lot of them, there's an immaturity uh, or, or a gap in development. The other thing that also I'm aware of is in many ways, there's also a untypical advance in maturity. So a lot of the students, especially again, I'm in district 12. So we have a lot of, you know, black and brown families, extended families, um, really strong social networks. And so a lot of these students took on roles that were, uh, if they were in school, they would not be doing. So they were taking care of siblings, they were taking care of grandparents, they were working for money, they were, you know, doing things that they were like, you know, little adults. And so they're coming in with this attitude into class where they were taking care of themselves. They had a lot more maturity and responsibility and freedoms and, uh, and, and that's clashing. So trying to figure out how to how to work that. Um, and, and so just one, again, acknowledging that about the students and then also acknowledging that the teachers, so you have all these teachers with uh, the, these students with these different experiences. And then you have all these teachers who were not ready for even a typical experience because maybe they were new. And so that they've been, you know, teaching from home with their tea and picturing a very nice, you know, experience where students often were students were in their own homes. So if there was a disruption or a student who wasn't fully engaged, it was an absence, right? And now they're suddenly in a classroom where the students are together. So if one student's disruptive, it's spreading. Whereas online, that didn't happen, right? So the worst thing that happened is they dropped off. But now you have teachers with not a lot of experience of classroom suddenly being put into these situations where um, it's, it's, it's these compounding dynamics. So just really acknowledging that and letting them know through no fault of their own, they were teaching in the wild. <laughs> and, and so it's gonna take them a couple of years to get up to speed and find their rhythm. And that's okay, right? None of this is, is anyone did anything wrong or bad. It's just acknowledging it and adding in the supports that are needed. How can teachers take care of themselves I'm afraid that being so involved in their students' lives, they're ignoring their own lives, and it can have a real personal impact that's very negative on themselves. What can you suggest? Yeah, yeah, so that's my backdoor self-care <laughs> strategy. <laughs> so often I'm brought into a school to um, work with the students and work with the teachers to work with these students. 
right? So how can we teach, how can we build in activities that are teaching students basic empathy, right? They've been home with their family and I know my family behaved a certain way that we did not behave when we're around other people. So if for the past two years, they've only been around their family and behaving that way, they need to be taught basic social skills, basic interaction. So building that into the classroom. How do we do parent share? How do we do small groups? How do we do A and B teams? Uh, and really being mindful of doing these things with the intention of building the social skills. So there's the content and then there's the skill building uh, and then um, there's the process of how we do it. Uh, so my backdoor way to teachers is I have the teachers, when I work with the teachers and do teacher trainings, um, I have them do the exercises and I have them pick the exercises that they would do. I say, here's a stack of, you know, 32 mindfulness cards. Um, you know, some of them are great. Some of them are terrible. Pick the 10 that are the best and pick the ones that you would do. So the idea is um, having the teachers integrate social emotional learning, whether it's a breathing skill, a grounding skill, a problem solving skill into their class at least once a week, and then they're doing it themselves. Um, so that's one way to get them to just build in a reset into their classes on a regular basis. And then maybe one thing each class, like a short thing. Um, and then giving them the time and the space. The teacher said, we want our own time with you. We, we want to be able to like acknowledge what we've been going through. We need our teacher time. Um, so, so those are some of the things and, um, and, and just really understanding, be gentle on ourselves, be gentle with others, um, because what we've been going through has been traumatic, has not been typical. And in the, in the long run, it'll take some time to, to even out. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. When people ask me for advice, again, I'm not a psychologist, but mm -hmm. the fact that you may have a title, people assume that mm -hmm. you're knowledgeable. So mm -hmm. I just tell people they should meditate, they should exercise, and they should eat healthy. I figure those three, I'm not making any mistakes. Yeah, um, sounds good. <laughs> um, and I think, and the eating healthy, I think, because I think um, I met a lot of people who during the pandemic have gained all kinds of weight. Mm -hmm. um, and that has really a negative impact on them, not only health wise, but also psychologically. Yeah, and I think uh, all these things are tied together um, in a strange sort of way. I mean, I've had friends who've gained 20 pounds in the two years mm -hmm. and I worry about them because of, I mean, are there some reason why they're gaining so much weight and why they're eating so much? Mm -hmm. um, and I try to, you know, uh, tell them to, you know, be thoughtful about, about what you're doing to yourself. Mm -hmm. um, and again, it all started in March, 2020. Yeah, yeah, that's an excellent point. You know, I jokingly said earlier, the COVID-19 turns into the COVID-25, turns into the COVID-30. Um, so when I was just talking with my intern today, uh, tomorrow we're doing mindful eating, right? To teach the students to slow down, to focus on what you're eating, um, because that whole eating piece, and you know, people who have been working from home and teaching from home, we weren't moving right? Chiropractors are making a fortune right now because <laughs> we were not moving and it's going to take us some time and some intention, right? To actually start um, cleaning things up a bit. Okay. Is there anyone else who wants to add anything in? I wanted to just share right? something. Yeah, I wanted to just share something. During your presentation, you talked about teletherapy that you have done with your students, um, with, the, with the school's um, Correct? Yes. Wait one second. I don't know why I lower your hand. Uh, so I wanted to just share that. Um, I wanted to just share that personally, like it, teletherapy worked so well. I'm a parent, like I shared. My son developed anxiety during COVID. Like he was washing his hand like crazy. And I didn't know what to do with that. So I reached out for help. I was like, this is really like, he was very afraid of catching COVID. Um, so teletherapy really, really saved us uh, when I reached out and just having a conversation with a therapist, with a professional like you, 
Mm -hmm. um, and it really helped him. And within a few months, like right now, we came up with a strategy, like you only wash your hand if you go to the bathroom, if you come home from school or outside and before you eat, just coming up with those strategies and like giving him the tool helped, like it was like magic. Initially mm -hmm. when it happened, I was like, oh my God, what do I do now? Along with teaching and te helping him. And now we have the anxiety that mm -hmm. was um, induced to COVID, due to COVID. But just like having someone, we had like Zoom conversation and having a therapist talk to him uh, and like help him to manage the anxiety right now, nothing. Like it's his, he, he gets it. Like it's not something to be afraid of and just use those as a strategy. Um, so thank you for sharing that. Yeah, yeah. And also, I guess just to, to echo that and then, um, uh, you know, circle back on, on, on Goodman's comment, how can teachers practice self-care? Um, you know, depending on where your teacher or what your situation is, use your insurance. If you've got coverage to meet with a psychologist, <laughs> use it. Uh, one of the great outcomes of the pandemic is it has smashed so many barriers of access to care, access to community, access to resources. Um, suddenly, you know, teletherapy is very, very available and um, use it. Even if you're not feeling like, oh, it's a crisis or, oh, it's whatever. If you've got the coverage, use it. Um, and if you don't have the coverage, um, you know, use it or, or, or figure it out or consider it. Um, um, that's one of the things I really push um, is, is, is really use everything that's available for you. Um, and if nothing else, just, just so you're not leaving money on the table, you earned it, you worked for it. Right. And, 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 and it's, it's an important thing. And sometimes people just need the permission to do that. And so I grant you the permission <laughs> to go out and, and take care of yourself in whatever way, um, you know, is best for you and your life. But also that was just such a wonderful story about access to, um, mental health care. So thank you. That was great. Just one thing, the teachers union, the UFT has a member's assistance program. Mm -hmm. Any teacher can contact them for a number of meetings with a licensed psychologist mm -hmm. who can then refer you to someone who's covered by your insurance. Mm -hmm. So if you go on the UFT website and look for the MAP, the member assistance program, um, you should take advantage of it if you feel you're in need of that service. And of course, we all are at one time or another. Yeah, and that was one of the points that also came up when we were talking about the individual sessions. And that's one of the reasons the classroom push-ins came in. We're like, well, who needs the therapy? And we're like, who doesn't need the therapy, right? Who doesn't? And so then we're like, okay, we're just going to work with every class in the eighth grade, right? And, yeah, and yeah. start doing interventions in addition to individual. Um, yeah, but I mean, who doesn't? Yeah. It, it's not a stigma. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the people say, well, well, I only go to a psychologist if there's something wrong with me. Mm -hmm. but I, I think we have to get past that because mm -hmm. um, I think it can, it can help all of us. Well, mm -hmm. it's, it's six o'clock. So it's, I think it's time for us to go for dinner. Um, again, have a healthy meal. Uh, <laughs> you should limit your alcoholic drinks to as few as possible. Um, again, um, I become a, sort of a pain in the neck to people sort of because I, I just think it's very destructive of people's health if they stop taking care of themselves and start letting themselves go. People, again, drinking too much, eating too much. It's simply, it's a, that's a reason to go to a psychologist, not a dietitian, because mm -hmm. you're drinking too much and eating too much for a reason. And you should deal with the underlying reason before you can actually cut back. So let me thank everybody. I think this was really, really wonderful. Um, we recorded this. So as, uh, as soon as it's up on YouTube, I'll let you know, um, because I think there's so many valuable things in this. And let me thank um, the teachers who, who participated. You were absolutely wonderful, again. And, um, I, and, and let me again uh, thank Dean Lamboy for uh, uh, participating with us and really helping, to Marty uh, Rosamond and Catherine Franklin, uh, the, the professors who really help put this together. I think this is extremely worthwhile. And I think uh, it's, again, um, it's one small step at a time. But if you do a lot of small steps, it equals one big step. So thank you very much and have a great evening.